I think this is stage two of like, uh, I guess you would say like any level of uh, enlightenment, you could say. And this is, of course, my stage two, would you say? Would you say level two, Asmin? What would you say to that? See how he's like leveling it? It's not that hard to level. That's why when people tell me like, oh, I'm offended you're categorizing or leveling people. No, you're not offended. You're worried that you are going to be the thing that you think is bad. You're worried that I'm going to place you on a level you don't see yourself because you believe you're more introspective. Now look, if Asmin sees this, I definitely want him to hit me up because I think he's lovely and I think he's hilarious and I'm definitely uh, a fan of his content. I like it. I like his commentary on interpersonal relationships in the world. And so let's just get into it, guys. Let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, so this video is called Digital Surrogates Are Destroying Us. This is like from five months ago, but I was listening to it. And for like just a 10 minute segment or so, Asmin starts to not only create his own level system, like as he's going, which is hilarious, he's so aware of bubbles. And I just wanna show you guys what I mean and how my work isn't everything you watch. It just is said differently and in a way that it doesn't sound woo woo. So you guys don't pay attention to it, but it's there. Like people are constantly using language that I use, I'm just making a brand off of it. So it sounds like I'm taking it very seriously, which only if you need to, right? It's just a tool, only if you need to take it seriously. Introspection is a serious business, but it also can be casual. It also takes a lot of spoons and a lot of effort to be introspective. And for a lot of people, it's just too much work. So I get that. But let's go ahead and play this video together and we'll go ahead and talk about it. I think you guys, you guys will like it. I definitely was thrilled to hear Asmin using this language. I was like, oh, what did he, did he just say level one? Did Asmin just say level one? What is he doing? The only thing that really matters. So if you do something okay. that you're satisfied with and you enjoyed and you had Perfect. fun doing it, then it mattered. But if you want to say that it had no ultimate effect, then that's just an endless fucking Russian nesting doll that leads to nihilism in the middle because nothing ever really matters because entropy is going to kill everything in the universe. So what's the point of having this conversation? Now it's in the beauty is in the eye of the beholder in this, I think. Video game levels you know I saying? played as a teenager, except I've been doing so from game breaking perspectives, no clipping through the walls and exploring how everything was set up. Mm -hmm. These experiments completely shatter my nostalgia. I get a dissociative view of this fantasy as if I'm observing it for the first time and I get to see it for what it really is a toneless combination of programming and polygons. The game is revealing to me the horror which always existed behind the pixel skin. I think this is stage two of like, uh, I guess you would say like any level of uh, enlightenment, you could say, and this is of course my- Stage two, would you say? Would you say level two, Asmin? What would you say to that? See how he's like leveling it? It's not that hard to level. That's why when people tell me like, oh, I'm offended you're categorizing or leveling people, no, you're not offended. You're worried that you are going to be the thing that you think is bad. You're worried that I'm going to place you on a level you don't see yourself because you believe you're more introspective or you want to believe you are. But the moment somebody tries to level your introspection, you get offended because it doesn't reflect how or it, or it doesn't appear the way you think of yourself. Like it doesn't sound like that's that's not me. That's not how I think of myself. No, 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 no. So in this video where this original OP is talking about where this OP is talking about like, you know, you're going through life like a video game. You're unaware of what's happening until you realize like, what is this place I live in? It's like, yeah, that's the one stage asking yourself like, what is this place that I live in? But then there's so many more layers of introspection and most people don't go there. That's why when Tom Foolery and I were talking and he said something like, oh, Brittany, like many people don't ask themselves that question though. Exactly. If there's a question most people aren't asking themselves, then you yourself are admitting that people absolutely can be categorized on levels of introspection. You can't even tell me that there isn't a thing X that people are all ignoring. There's a thing X that people are literally not asking themselves. And you wanna tell me there's not levels of introspection. Assumption in my opinion is that stage one is just being taken back and you know being a complete control, uh, being a complete slave to consumerism and being able to see these things as, you know, oh wow, this is so special, it's so cool, I'm so special for having it, I'm so special for doing it. And then like the second level was being able to see the man behind the machine and all of the pieces that come together and seeing how it's not as special as it used to be.
and it's actually not this magic thing. It was just programmed for you to win. And then I think the next stage of that is being able to appreciate it anyway, mm. being able to appreciate what you get out of it because mm. it's got nothing to do really with what the game, mm. what the game does. It's what the game does for you. And what mm. Love this. So again, when I was thinking about introspection levels, I was thinking about your relationship uh, between existing, so you, yourself, and existence, everything outside of yourself. So he's ref referencing existence, the game, and existing, what you get out of it. But I'll, that's about you, right? That's why I say you start with yourself, you refer to existence, the things outside of yourself, and then you come back to yourself, okay? So you start with who am I? Who am I in relation to the world? Back to who am I, right? What you do in the game <laughs> is to be able to see something that is not complete and not perfect and still acknowledge that it was special to you and it is special to you and nothing's going to ever take that away that's what i think so there's something to be said and we have this discussion on my discord 101 we do a discord 101 um event on on my discord <laughs> join through patreon where we talk about you know my work we let people you know if you have criticisms or questions like that's the best section like come to that event i will answer any question you have even if it's as simple as like what's a level one like i am happy to answer during that time that's why i built the event especially for newbies who are new to my work but when you're when you're having that relationship with introspection, extrospection, you're having a relationship with yourself and where you belong in the bubbles. And that's why it's important to ask yourself, where do I belong in the world, i.e. bubbles? And then where can I go? So right now I'm in the Croatian bubble. I live in a country called Croatia, and that's the bubble. And I'm going to adhere to the bubbles expectations of my behavior, the cultural expectations of behavior for the town or city or country that I am in, right? And then outside of that, I come home and I live in this apartment with my partner, and then we've curated a bubble. We have a cultural of culture culture of expectation within our home bubble there's things i expect of him there's things he expects of me right and then we have friends and family people we socialize with we just got married we had a wedding we had to mix our bubbles with his friends bubbles and his parents bubbles and their family's culture and then we had to talk about the bubble within his own family dynamic and the bubble within his friends bu uh, bubble cultural uh, uh, expectation. We had to mesh together. And then we still had to ask ourselves, like, who are we while we're getting married? Who are we after? Who are we when we're talking to other people? Who are we when we're live streaming? Like, who am I when I'm reviewing Asmin? Who's Asmin when he's talking to his dad? Who's anyone when they're doing anything, right? I think there's like a core self that exists within us. And I think your job, if you want it to be, is to be introspective enough to understand that core part of yourself and then to see if it is actually true. I've had so many people say like, I think my core self is this, but as long as, but if I dig deeper with them and we do calls and I ask them why, why, why over and over again, they eventually realize like, oh shoot, maybe that's not my core. Maybe that's not who I am. And then they have to have that kind of very scary very scary bubble hopping, bubble popping moment where they realize like, am I not who I think I am? Am I somebody a little different? And no matter how well we can observe ourselves, sometimes we are blinded by our biases, our exhaustion, our mental health. That's why I said in my last live stream, like, look, when you're making a decision and you're holding an opinion, you have to make sure you're holding the opinion and representing yourself when you're happy and healthy. Because if you're distorted by bias or by pain, you won't be able to see yourselves clearly, let alone see me clearly. So when the when the internet, like what was that girl's name? Boots? That girl Boots was on that panel with me and obviously super bitter, which I get it, girl. Life is hard. But she was like angry at me and we had never spoken. I don't even know this girl from Joe Schmo. Like who is she? Right? But she already decided I was her enemy. She didn't see me as a person. She objectified the persona on the internet. She built a parasocial relationship with me. And she would probably deny this, but that's what she did. She built a parasocial hate relationship with me and decided to attack me on the internet when she had the opportunity to get to know me as a person, to talk to me, to humanize me. She couldn't do it. She lacks the introspection, I think, to to humanize herself, let alone me, right? Because like that bitter energy she had, it's just like, it's a lot. So again, I don't, you know, I get it. Like the internet only takes itself so seriously. So maybe she's not very serious about her work and that's fine too. But again, that's why we have to have those like relationships with ourselves. Because when I'm, when I'm dealing with boots, I can't sit there and go like, oh, this random part of existence, like why is it yelling at me? I just have to be like, oh, okay, this part of existence is having its own relationship with itself and it's like trying to shoot me along with it, but like I'm just gonna dodge these bullets, girl. 
I'm going to dodge these bullets, girl, because this ain't about me. This ain't about me. Boots' is existing isn't about me. She and I interacted, so then our bubbles bumped up against each other, right? We had a collision of bubbles. But then again, I don't have to shatter my whole identity because someone's bubble pressed up against mine. I just be like, oh, hey, what's up, bros? Have my moment with them and move on, right? It's all lifeless data, and anything that was fascinating in the game was surrogate stimulating my biological imperatives. Yeah. Most video game achievements have negligible real-world applications. <laughs> Let's listen to that one again. Most video game achievements have negligible real-world applications. Man, bro, if I was 16, I would be downvoting the fuck out of this video. I would be so mad. They're artificial challenges with artificial fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Yet we pursue these objectives with the same vigor and passion we would have normally used to fulfill physiological needs. Okay, so the other few months ago, I was playing Minecraft with my Discord server. Um, we don't do that anymore, but we did it for a short time. And I don't like video games uh, for two reasons. And my, my philosophy on video games and board games and games in general is like, does it make me money or do I get to orgasm? <laughs> like Those are the two, two reasons I do something. Um, obviously, like mental stimulation is important, but like I do YouTube because it's mentally stimulating and I get to make money. And then I, you know, have relationships with people, you know, because often they lead to both those things slash orgasms. But video games don't give me that satisfaction. I have yet to find a video game that gives me that satisfaction. My, my partner's friends were saying like, oh, I'm surprised you're not a gamer. You love anime. You love being online. You watch Asmongold. Like, why aren't you a gamer? And I was like, I just, I don't want to do it. It seems boring. I don't get the fulfillment. But I was playing Minecraft for a little while. And I kind of liked it for a second. There was something really satisfying about hitting things, but I didn't want to learn the rules of how to make things. I didn't want to like get to the dragon. I didn't want to have to do things that were like too much work. I just wanted to build stuff. Like the first house I built was totally out of dirt and everyone's like, Brittany's such a boomer. Yeah. But like I'm getting the satisfaction out of hitting something. And then one day while I was high off my ass, I was like, bro, I could just do this, but make money. Why am I doing this? And I like, just lost interest in Minecraft because again, I'm already grinding as hard as I can to like make my job work and like make it a thing. And so I can't just spend my time for free unless I'm really interacting with people and playing games with people is fun, but it doesn't have enough stimu stimulating conversation associated with the gaming. So I noticed on my discord, if we were talking about philosophy and then we started gaming, the conversation would get, definitely go downhill, right? It would definitely go less introspective and then therefore I wouldn't get the mental stimulation to keep playing the game and so I realized like okay it's not games I like it's the opportunity to do something while I'm thinking but it's really hard to do that when you're like it's just really hard to do that sometimes it seemed to be difficult at least on my server um Bryson brings up that I do enjoy Smash Bros I enjoy Smash Bros because it's short and it's fast but I haven't played Smash Bros in like three months I only play it if somebody wants to play with me. Like one of my callers, he wants to play with me this month, which is great. I fucking love that shit. I want to do it. I want to play a tournament on the Discord soon, you know, when I'm set up. I would love that. But I haven't played in three. I would never play on my own. I would need somebody to be like, Brittany, get on Smash. I want to play. Like I would need one of my brothers to want to play with me. But I don't play on my own, even though I own a Switch. Like I, I'm not going to play on my own. I bought the Switch so I could play games with my brothers um, or you guys, right? So again, it's not that gaming, gaming is great. I love that it works for certain people. For me, I'm just more of a consumer of like the content. But again, wait, why did I bring this up? I lost my train of thought. Oh, the the OP is talking about how, um, you know, life is like kind of like a game and the effort we put into gaming. I think his initial premise of his video is that like the world is destroying itself because of online relationships and it's not living its real life. But like your life is real, even if it's online. It just depends on how you're processing that real life. You know what I mean? If you're online thinking you have like magic and you're wizards and you're all like making potions and it's for real, real, like, I don't know, maybe we can have a conversation. But then again, religion exists. So like, who am I to judge? But then like some people just use gaming as a hobby and that's also really great. So like gaming, you know what I mean? Okay. So when you're playing the game and you're trying to figure out which game you're playing, you can play the, I have a hobby and I like my hobby and I work to play my hobby. Or you can play the game where I'm going to turn my hobby into a job. You can play the game where my hobby gets me friends, but like you have to be the arbiter. You have to be the creator. You have to make the decision to say, this is how I'm going to utilize this tool called gaming, right?
I don't really think that's true. I think that a lot of people uh, don't have the tools to do that. And that's why you see a lot of people who, as they get older, they stop playing as many video games because they replace what the video game gave for them, that sense of pride and accomplishment in, you know, completing 16 star in a certain amount of time or, you know, 60 star in a certain amount of time. And they've replaced that with instead uh, having a sense of fulfillment for their job or having a sense of fulfillment. I will say, and I said this on my, I think gaming, look, I think a lot of things in life is at, are adolescent. I, I think I'm a big child, right? But I cannot play video games as I end up needing to be more responsible for other things. Because again, the time it would take me to play a video game would be way too much time that doesn't coincide with my responsibilities, like buying a house, making sure that I have retirement, making sure that I have all these goals met. I'm never going to be a pro gamer, right? So it's a bad business move. I don't pay attention to gaming long enough to invest in it. So it wouldn't be reasonable to try to make money off of it. Like nothing about it would work for me as a person. But for some people, it does work for them. So it, th again, you can have your hobby and your job. But as you get more responsibility, you your hobbies have to coincide with your jobs. They have to make sense. Like they can't take up too much of your time. Now, again, I've always dated gamers. I have gamer brothers. I have gamers in my life. None of these people game for only two hours a day. It's always like four to six, four to eight, four to 10. And they work and they make like good money and stuff like that. But it's a hobby that seems like really all encompassing and everyone's different. Uh, we asked Alexa today, like how much time do people spend online? Americans, an average of seven and a half hours, apparently, according to Alexa. So I think that that's interesting. Advroski says, um, you're too money brained. Well, I mean, yeah, that's my joy. My joy is like grinding, making money, being the breadwinner, buying a house. Like I can't like, you know what I mean? Like, of course. Right. Um, that makes sense. But it's not bad that it's like you might be game brained. But I do think there's a sense of like responsibility that you must be you have to balance that somehow. Because I couldn't imagine gaming for six hours a day and still being able to meet my responsibilities. Like, how would I ever? I couldn't meet them personally. So there's like that relationship you have to have with that responsibility. And sometimes people do lose themselves to the addiction of the game. And they grind so hard in a game when they could have grinded that hard in real life and gotten the rewards in real life. But now they just have it in the game. So again, it's like you have to have that relationship with the balance. Again, game if you want a game. My partner's a gamer, so I'm not talking shit. Okay. All his friends are gamers. My brothers are gamers. But it's a different kind of relationship they're having with it, right? A different kind of, yeah, there's something different happening, right? I think Brit would love games just with good stories. No, no. I also hate RPGs. I hate story games. I don't want anything I have to spend my time, again, unless it makes me money or I just don't know how it could be. Again, I'm not judging games off of my likes, I'm just telling you how my brain works so you can figure out how your brain works, right? You know what I mean? Um, so I, again, I'm not talking about, like, I'm not shitting on games. Like, games are great. But again, I, like, um, one of my viewers bought me a game called Haven, I think it's called, on the Switch, about, like, two cute fairy kids, basically, who are in love and they're running away from their culture on this planet. And it's really cool looking. It's, like, a 20-hour game. And I, like, cannot care. Like, I love it. I like playing it, like, for 10 minutes at a time. But I still haven't beaten it. And it's been, like, two, three years. He's going to laugh if he hears me say this. But, like, literally, I just, I'm like, okay. Like, I, it's cool. They even make out in the game. There's, like, sexy thing. It's, like, very emo. It's very cool. But, like, I think I'd rather just read a book. Like, you know what I mean? Okay, so books are my thing. I've read less books as I've needed to be more – here, Okay. Your games are my books. I have read less books in the last five years than I've read my whole life, right? I've read thousands of books because I have too many responsibilities and reading is too much of a luxury and it doesn't make me money. I can't justify reading a 500 page book and I can't transfer it into money, right? And I can't do my hobby for fun right now because I need to work mostly. I need to focus on working. Like that's my goal. That is my responsibility as the breadwinner and the person who's going to financially secure myself into retirement, right? And I'm loving that, right? I'm loving it. And once I do that and I have more of a schedule, I'll definitely bring my hobby back into it. But I'm not a person who 
like, again, I'm very goal focused. So if I'm working on a goal, everything else doesn't matter. I just have to meet this goal. And then I'm like satisfied in other ways. So does that kind of make sense? Like I'm grinding in real life to attain this goal, but I'm not sure that people who can play video games for eight hours a day are not neglecting responsibilities. I'm not sure people who make their hobby the majority of their day aren't neglecting some responsibilities. And they don't have to, by the way, be responsible for the same things I want to be responsible for, right? Um, money is the priority, priority over learning or anything else in life. Well, my job is about learning. So the way I make money is to learn more. Most jobs, you have to learn something to maintain them. So I would argue that, you know what I mean? And everyone, again, don't, I'm not saying you have to be like me. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I find it like I don't need to complain about how hard life is because I already know that the way to make life work for me is to play the game of financial security and making sure I live where I want to live and I have the lifestyle I want. And then hobbies are the luxury I get to benefit from. I get to have a life where I can just exist. But I can't complain and throw myself into a video game or into YouTube or into Twitch streamer girls with big titties, yum, because again, I already have a goal I'm doing. But I think a lot of people put the blame on the games. They'll put the blame on the titty girls. They'll put a blame on OnlyFans girls. They'll put the blame on porn and addiction. Well, addiction is a real illness, but you know what I mean? They'll put the blame on the something else, the existence. But it's really about your existing. Do you have an internal goal? Do you know what game you're playing? Do you even know why you want the hobby you have? One of my friends is a teacher and she's in her like 60s now. And she is a teacher who makes money so she can do quilting. That's like her love and joy is quilting. So she's like, oh, I love working. I love my job. She loves her kids. But she spends like $20,000 on a quilting machine. That's her joy. That's her joy in life. She has a house. She's got a husband. Everything's good there. But she spends her hobby time on doing art, right? She's an amazing, does amazing quilts. So again, we all play the game for a specific reason, right? And so that's the question. Val says, can you do audiobooks? I don't have time to read anymore. Um, my brain, I need, I I like YouTube the best. So if the audiobook has a visual, that really helps me. Because I need to like turn around and look at something. If I'm listening to an audiobook, my mind will wander. Like I'll just start, I love reading. But again, I can't listen to an audiobook right now unless I can justify it for work. But most of my book content, just it, that's not where the money is. My money is on interpersonal relationships. My money is on, you know, talking about Asmongold. It's not reading books. Like as much as people say they want me to read more books, they – it's – unless you're a booktuber, it's not really a money-making part of it, right? So I'd rather just keep my hobby my hobby. Um, anyways, okay. For like having a family or something like that because a lot of video games are used for young kids and uh, young guys especially. Like if you're a 16-year-old guy – you're a fucking loser. You have probably no skills that anybody gives a fuck about. You're probably stupid. And it's not going to change anytime soon. And nobody takes you seriously. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. And you know what? Whenever you're fucking 40, you're going to probably think, you know what? They were right. But the truth is that those guys that are 16 still want to have an environment where they can feel like they are accomplishing something. And in the world that we live in now, there aren't wars that you have to go out and fight in. There aren't these, you know, fucking eternal conflicts of, of battle and glory that people used to always die in. So people resort to having these, these fake ones like video games because it can simulate that type of feeling. I don't think... I will say, and I'll be honest with you, because I was contemplating on um, making a video on this, that when I was reading books as a young person, I was escaping reality so i could jump into these books that were great that's why i could read thousands of them because i could jump into these different worlds but then i was picking up tools and i was learning about myself and eventually when i was reading philosophy and i was reading like books on how the world work and i was like oh wait there's like a game i can play in the real world that doesn't just exist in these books right i don't you know and so i realized over time the person that i am today i contribute heavily to how many books i've read but which books i've read not that i can remember but like you know i've read all these books and they taught me that bubbles exist. They taught me that everyone is so different. They taught me the world will see one thing and have a different like perspective relationship with it. Books taught me so much about my life. So there is a point where maybe you start off with escapism, but then if you can turn it into introspection, 
That is the key. If you can turn your escapism into introspection, then you don't fall prey to waking up one day and thinking like, what have I done with my life? Which again, if you want to wake up at 50, look, why do y'all think we have midlife crises? Why are you having midlife crises? Why are people waking up at their 40s and 50s and saying like, who am I? What have I done with my life? Who have I married? Why are people having those and then claiming to be introspective? Why wouldn't a truly introspective person, how would they even have a midlife crisis? So I'm just trying to say, if you want to avoid having a midlife crisis, you want to avoid blowing up your life in your 50s or 40s, let's have a conversation now as we're aging into that demographic. Maybe you're already there. That's great. No no, you know, no harm in starting now where you're not going to have that midlife crisis, where you're not going to wake up all of a sudden and be like, wait, didn't I just graduate college? What the fuck? Like, I don't want you to think that it's too late for you. And I don't want you to think it's too late to start. But I want you to know that you might wake up one day and wonder what happened to my life. You probably threw yourself into an escapism, right? Something you were distracting yourself with, only to realize like time did not stop for you. That's why I want to see those TikToks that are so funny with like, how are kids who are born in 2001, 21 when I'm still 15 and I was born in 1989? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't think time stops for us, but it does. I am 34. I am, I got to get my shit together with my job. I got to take it seriously. You know what I mean? I got to actually think about making this my full-time job because right now it's not for me. It could disappear tomorrow, right? It could always disappear for all of us. But there is a point in a career where you're a little bit more solidified to build a resume. And since I just started playing that game like three, four years ago, I'm still a little bit behind of other people. But like that's the game I get to play now. It's like, okay, cool. How do I make this like a real job? How do I become serious about it? Because to be honest with you, like I always thought it was going to die. So I didn't need to invest in 60-year-old Brittany. She wasn't supposed to live that long. So I can't just read books all day. I can't just do BDSM all day. I can't just have fun all day. I have to be responsible. I think that's fundamentally a bad thing. But I think any amount of any of this is always a bad thing whenever it's used to an extreme. So whenever people can only play video games and they only get that fulfillment out of video games, that's what an issue is. But what, my, what I'm saying is that as that kid gets older, as he turns 21, 24, graduates from college, maybe. Uh Sorry, hold, hold on, Aspen. Heck says, I don't think there's such a thing as a waste of time and people attach their personal views onto the choices as a waste of time. I agree. There is no such thing as a waste of time because like time is an illusion and then we all die. So who cares? But in order to avoid thinking you've wasted your time, you actually have to be introspective enough to make the decision to spend your time a particular way. You actually have to choose how you spend your time and not just fall into it. Not just, well, I hate my life, so this is all I'm going to do. You actually have to choose this life and then choose the consequence of picking that life. Otherwise, it might feel like a waste of time in your 40s and 50s when you have your midlife crisis. Uh, 22, whatever, right? Gets his first big job, gets married, uh, has a kid, gets promoted to like a serious position. He's making a six-figure salary. A lot of times, those accomplishments and that life cannibalizes the life that he previously had playing video games all the time. I have a lot of friends that have had that happen. How about you guys? You guys had that happen? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there you go. And and so, like, obviously, some people are not able to make that transition because, like, they're not, you know, they're, they're not old enough. They don't have the money to do it. Uh, they're not smart enough to do it. They're too lazy or, or, you know, like life just dealt them a bad hand in one way or another. So the point is that I, I think that to say that video games are bad in this way is kind of limited because I think that video games do provide a large value for a subset of people that don't really have as many real world uh, ways to get that value anymore. Like there's not a lot of ways that an, you know, a 19 year old kid can, can, can feel like he's worth something, can really accomplish something that's his own. And How do you guys feel about that? Because again, depending on where you grew up or what the expectation of you was, most of the ways, and again, I grew up in an immigrant entrepreneurial bubble. So of course, one of the key ways to feel like you accomplished something was to make money. Obviously, that's like really easy in my bubble, like make money, 
Like my siblings, some of us have a bet of who has the largest net worth by the time one of my brothers reaches 30. So we're all like, how many years do we have? And we're all like working really hard. I'm going to definitely fucking fail at this point. But Jesus, some of my brothers are killing it. But like my farm brother at 19 felt accomplished because he had his own car paid off. Um, He bought like a $300 van. Literally, he didn't care. He worked two jobs. He made money. He had a savings of like, I don't even know how much, 10 to 20K. It was something crazy. He had um a good relationship with God at that time. He still does. He was looking for his wife, eventually found her at 22. Um, He felt accomplished. I think it's easy to feel accomplished where I come from as long as you have like a good job and you're kind of independent. That's all my parents kind of require of you outside of their religion. Their religion will never be satisfied to them. So don't even try to hold your breath about that. But in terms of just being an adult, my mom just wants us to be financially independent, which a lot of us are failing because we're in the same boat everyone else is, which is like handling the U.S. economy, which is difficult. So we're in the same boat everyone else is. But, you know, I'm not going to complain. I think we're doing OK. We're not great. And we're definitely like struggling sometimes. But I mean, who isn't? So we're kind of like just doing our best. But we have a reason to be proud of that because we are facing so many issues That if you can just maintain a good job, if you can just maintain a good life, if you can just be kind to people, I say gold star, baby. I say gold star, right? So again, what is the pressure you're putting on yourself? Who is it coming from? Is it coming from your bubble? Is it coming from you? So when Asman says like, there's no not not a good way for a 19 year old to feel proud of himself. Well, according to who? 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 (laughs) And not just a outcome of a school system or an outcome of his parents or something like that, but something that he owns and that is his own. And I think that's something that video games give people. And while obviously every single thing can be used for bad, I don't think this fundamentally is. For hundreds of thousands of years, human beings have resided in tribes of about 30 to 70 people. And they saw maybe 20 young females in total during their entire lives. Yeah. Our minds are absolutely not updated to being bombarded with this overstimuli. My, my mind is. Our brains are wired. Ooh, hello, ladies. I love the overstimulation. Give me the over, give me three monitors, everything playing a video on each monitor. Ooh, look at this girl. <gasps> look at her. She's fucking killing it, bros. I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to do that so bad. Oh, so bad. Um, aren't we all just escape? Wait, aren't we all escape a type of reality, though, by changing our story, by moving home, streaming, picking up new ones, enlisting in the army, becoming sailors, just wanting to go someplace? Mm. So just like Asmin was talking about, and just like I talk about with levels of introspection, there's I'm going to run away. There's I'm going to pick my joy. There's I'm going to figure myself out. There's um, I'm going to ask myself like the, the question of like where I belong. These are all the same questions that can motivate someone to leave home, join the military, change their location, change their job. But how far you go with it matters. Some people just move countries and they're like, that's all I needed. I just needed to move out of America or I just needed to move out of my country. For some people, that's not good enough. If you're sad in a Mercedes, you're going to be sad in a Bentley. You're going to be sad in a Honda. You're going to be sad in a Bugatti. You're going to be – it's not always about environment for some of us. Some of our journeys are about that introspective relationship we're having with ourselves. Some of it is extrospection, but ultimately it's always a balance between the two. So again, we're all hopefully, once we realize it, changing the game we're playing to fit our joy. But I do think it starts with realizing like you need to escape into something else because the one you were born into isn't a vibe. For some people, like the one my brother was born into, my farm brother, he was born into the perfect bubble. He never had to leave his Catholic bubble. He had one moment in high school where he doubted his religion for like six months. And then he came right back to it, Catholic as ever. So like he didn't go through the atheist rebellious stage like I did where I left the church like my other brother did where we like had to question religion and we left the church completely or like my sister did or like this person. He just questioned his bubble for a second and then decided to stay in it because it really suits him and fits him and he loves it and he found his joy there. Married, four kids, makes really great money. So for him, he didn't have to escape anywhere. He had to find his joy within the bubble and then he had to make it work for him. You know what I mean? Now, he's like me, but bald, but he's literally like my same attitude about life, which is like, okay, what's the game? What are my tools? What are my limitations? Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, what are the rules here? Cool. How do I make it work for me, right? So 
um, my parents, when I was younger, would have consequences for what we could do as kids. And I would ask my parents, okay, if I break a rule, what is what is my punishment? And if the punishment wasn't bad enough, I would break the rule. And that's how I feel about the world. Like, what's the punishment for this? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then usually I'm willing to still do it, right? So what's the punishment for me not changing the way I talk? What's the punishment for me not getting along with everybody? What's the punishment for me for standing my ground? What's the punishment that the bubble is going to give? You know what I'm saying? And then I have a conversation with myself and I decide what to do anyways. Now, of course, there are appropriate moments to be inappropriate. Okay. So you kind of have to know yourself and know the situation to kind of know those things as well. Again, it's all a game, but the game changes for all of us. I am an optimist. I'm fine with the game. I think we're animals evolved on a planet and nobody owes me anything. But I owe myself plenty. To operate within the social context of a small community, the programming was crucial for ancient Well, humans. this is true. I mean, everybody knows this is true, right? Because like, have you ever had like a time where you're working in an office and there's like one girl that's your age and she's really not that attractive, but you're, you know, constantly simping for her, trying yep. to help her do stuff or whatever. Yeah, I remember I had this happen. First job I had too. Absolutely. Because I mean, that's what's there. Yeah, no, he's totally right about this element for sure. Yes. So in life, when you're in a small community, you could find happiness within that small community. Whether or not you can find joy depends on your relationship with your own introspection. Whoops. Hello. That's why I say like there's a midlife crisis that ends up hitting people because they live this life within this bubble. They marry the people within the bubble. They have a job within the bubble. They end up like kind of doing the script thing that they're given. Maybe that's what a regular person is, is like they're following the script like Mars said. Okay. So they got the script. They're following the script. And as long as they never deviate from the script, their life will probably be okay, right? But if they start to deviate, if they ask themselves for a moment, like, what if I could have something else? What if I did want something else? Well, it could be life shattering, bubble popping. It could be so hard for them that they realize like they might never have their ideal and they wish they never realized they wanted it in the first place. So they never realized they weren't happy, right? And that's what's interesting. Now, they were probably always happy. They probably just in that one moment from realizing to not realizing, not realizing to realizing became quote unquote unhappy. But I think there's joy in that unhappiness when you get to the third part that Asmund was talking about, which is like, okay, cool. So there's a game. Eh, how can I make the girl game work for me? Right? How do I not feel overwhelmed by the fact that I was forced into existence and I have to play this game the world has set out before I even was alive, right? And I think there's something to be said about that, right? Lacara says American Beauty, best movie about midlife crisis. American Beauty is a great, great film. Great film. And this happens so often with people where you're living your life and then one moment someone comes into your life and shatters your illusion of what you thought you had and moves you into a direction that you could blow up your whole life over. Or you could blow it up and not actually blow it up in a bad way and get something better out of it, right? So again, okay, it's up to you. But that's why when people talk to me and they go, I'm really upset that you're leveling people and you're putting people in categories. Why? Why? And I have to assume it's because you don't want to face the truth of where you might be in that categorization. And then you feel bad about yourself. But why? Who told you to let some girl on the internet dictate your joy? Who cares what Brittany Simon thinks about anything? How could you tell me you think I'm weird or that I'm silly or that Brittany Simon's crazy and then feel bad about what I say? Get angry about what I say. Get bitter about what I say. How could you have given me so much power in your life? Why? So silly. But very human, right? Um, Charles says, I think I've heard you say something along the lines of, if people who need to change don't, they die. Could you explain this? Um, I think there is a point. Yes. Oh, my God. Stop, Brittany. There is a point between... Living your life according to the bubble and just putting your head down. And even though you're not perfectly aligned with your consciousness, you're not completely aligned with your joy, you're happy enough and you're settling into this life. And I think a lot of people live their whole life settling, which is totally fine. Like, I don't care. I'm not here to change you, bro. But you live your life. And some people never question more than that. So they don't even know what their needs are. They only know what their needs or wants are based off of what the bubble has told them they need. You need a house. You need a husband. You need a job. You need this, right? 
But if they ask themselves, like, do I really need those things? Well, once you start to ask yourself that question, you ask yourself that question a thousand times and for the rest of your life, you start to realize like the way you need and the way you want, right? They're different. And what you thought you wanted, maybe you need. And what you thought you needed, maybe you just want, right? And then, oh my gosh, like, what does this mean for my identity? And what does this mean for who I am? I needed to find my joy. Happiness wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for Brittany. I needed to find my joy, my reason for, or my radical acceptance about being alive. I needed to find my radical acceptance for the fact that I existed and I would have to continue existing and I would have to live my life. I had to find that or I was just going to continue trying to like off myself. Like my past attempts, my relationship with unaliving myself, like it just would have cycled and cycled and cycled through until finally I accomplished that goal. Without a doubt, I have no doubt in my ability to eventually have accomplished that goal, right? Um, like last live show, we talked about why I think it's important to get a diagnosis if it's real, if it's a real diagnosis, because if I never got a diagnosis for BPD, I would never have gone to therapy to make it better. I wouldn't have known. Guys, I just watched a past video of mine. Guys, this is so embarrassing. I watched a past video of mine. Maybe, maybe I'll review it with you guys. Oh, one day. Maybe I'll, I'll, I need to read it over to see if I dox anyone's names or anything. But I watched an old video of mine. And in the video, she didn't know she had borderline because obviously I didn't even know what that was really. I thought I had depression and anxiety. And in the video, I'm talking about what it's like to date me when I have depression. And obviously I'm describing borderline. Like it's so insane. But because I didn't have the tools to know what borderline was or personality disorders, like they're just things you hear about in movies. They're not things you think you have. I never thought I have borderline. Like I never thought that. Until my therapist was like, have you ever heard of borderline? I was like, um, I, I guess, like maybe on Tumblr. I never thought about it as something that I could have. So I never, like Croatia, never thought about Croatia as a country, no offense. But now that I live here, Croatia is everywhere, right? It's like, you know things exist, but until they're your thing, you never pay attention. So I literally thought I had depression. And all the tools to fix depression have nothing to do with borderline. Not really. So here I was a borderline victim trying to fix herself with what she read on the internet about depression. Tell me how Brittany was going to find her joy. Okay, ow. Tell me how she was going to find her joy without getting diagnosed and without getting better. Because I could get happy, girls. I, I was so happy at points in my life when I was undiagnosed. So happy, but it never lasted. And it was never, and when it wasn't lasted, I never had anything to refer to. I never had a joy to refer to. So when I'm unhappy now, because happiness is an emotion that changes over time, you know, when I'm unhappy now, I'm still joyful. So I don't fall back into bitterness. I don't fall back into like negative feelings. I don't fall back into depression. I don't fall back into despair. I don't want to kill myself anymore. Oh, I'm never going to get ad review. I'm never going to get my AdSense to approve my videos. I say kill too much. Anyways, so again, when you can accomplish your joy, which is like a need Brittany had, now when I'm unhappy or life doesn't go great, or if let's say my I lose my job, I'm not going to default into a spiral. Because I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, that's life. But before, oh my God. Before, mm, mm. Charles says, how do you define joy? I have a video on this, guys. How to know the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion. It changes in circumstance. And over time, joy is consistent. It remains even if you are captured and put into a Nazi camp, right? Why do you think the Jews talk about the hope they held on to, the joy they had, not happiness. They weren't happy. They had a hope, a culture, a people to refer to. My parents in Iraq being targeted as Christians. They had joy. They had hope. They had a very specific thing they leaned on that kept them consistent no matter how hard life got. No matter how hard it was that my grandpa got lashes on his back because of soldiers in Iraq, no matter how scarred the skin was, the hope and joy remained. And joy and hope can change depending on where you are in your introspection journey. So you can have joy that's like a twos version of a joy and the joy that's like a five, per five level of a joy, different. But you know what I'm saying? Survival. However, the tribal context of life was subverted during the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. when the extended family was torn apart in order to move laborers into the cities. 
but a deep evolutionary need for communities continues to express itself. This is why people are so compelled to use digital surrogates in order no, to... No, I don't like this. I don't like this argumentation at all because I think that if you're going to use the Industrial Revolution and how people are able to get around with that, I think that you can't contextualize that around the Digital Revolution because the idea that people should move away from their family at 18 predates the Digital Revolution. So I, I think this is just a bad argument. I, I don't like it. And I think if anything, uh, we've... So you see how Asmin is like super aware of the argumentation, yes, but what he's referring to is like the bubble's perspective of how to come to conclusions. So you're born into a bubble and the bubble has a script and the bubble tells you the reason for things. If you're born into a Muslim country, they tell you the reason for their existence and they bring it through the lens of God. If you're born into an atheist community, they give you the reason for existence, born, in, born through the lens of their idea or theory about existence. Every household you're born into, every neighborhood you're in, every cult culture, every environment you're born into gives you answers for things, whether they're true or not, they claim to have answers. So here's this OP talking about how the answer, okay, is X. And Asmin is like, no, 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 no. That's not the answer. It's this answer. And then I'm going to sit here and go, no, 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 no. It's actually this answer. So when we were on that loneliness panel and people were like, so what's the answer to male loneliness? There is no one singular answer except introspection because then that has to do with you as a consciousness. But otherwise, I don't know you, you unique, beautiful butterfly. I don't know you and why you specifically are lonely. If you want us to figure it out together, you can sign up for a call. If you think it's more therapy you need, get a therapist. If you think you need a physical trainer, go to the fucking gym. But if you need to talk to someone about philosophy, you can call me. If you want to talk to someone about the consciousness, you can call me. But you are a unique little snowflake. And you can't go to a panel of fucking spectrum autists and ask them, hey, why am I lonely? I don't know you. And what is this idea of grouping all men into one fucking little bubble, whereas if we're going to know what happened for all of male loneliness? I don't know. So we have to think about the individual. Because there is no answer for a group of people. Ask the gays. We all have a different idea of what would help us. Okay. You've gone closer back to like what it was beforehand. You see what I'm saying? Tweet super chat or check the news incessantly. Wait, are, are people not understanding that? Yeah, he leaves like a 150, 200 years gap. I I'm saying that like in the 60s, right? 70s, 80s, 90s even. Before like we were living in the digital age in any capacity that we are now. Uh, the socially acceptable thing, go back, watch movies back then, was for people to move out at 18 and to go somewhere completely different, you know, go to, you know, some fucking like college, some other place. So I, I just, I don't think that it's fair to, uh, to, to distill that problem down to the digital age. Well, I think even more than that, I would say that depending on your bubble, you wouldn't have left home until you were married. Depending on your cultural background, you wouldn't have gone to college at 18, right? It depends on where you come from. College is a minority move. It only became more popular during what? Millennials? And barely. Like, you know what I mean? And a lot of people in Gen Z, I know, don't go to college. So again, where you were born tells you like I didn't have to finish college I went for like three months or like I don't even know maybe a couple semesters I hated school I'm really bad at school I went to community college and I hated it I wasn't gonna pass I don't understand how college works I'm not that person but my siblings who did go to college and graduated like it was like they were made for it somehow it's like they really understood how to do it I do not understand school I'm like put me in jobs I remember coming to my parents and saying hey I know you want me to like go to school for a little while even though you call it a liberal brainwashing machine but what if I just work and I Dropped out of school and I just worked three jobs and that's what I did. And it was great. Partied all through my 20s, went to San Diego every weekend, partied until fucking 4 a.m. and then slept two hours and then went to work, worked 20 hours a day, easy, no problem, made money, didn't live with, I had no debt. I was learning how to drive. I didn't learn how to drive till I was 18 because um, I wasn't allowed to get a license as a teenager because I was rebellious. And then, um, you know, just like figured out my life, right? Try to figure out why I shouldn't unalive myself. That's really how I spent my 20s. Why shouldn't I unalive myself? Prove it to me. And I was looking for existence to prove it to me. And that was a mistake because existence sucks. Y'all suck. The world sucks. People are lame. But what I found was 
if you can pinpoint the really awesome people, if you can pinpoint the one or two or five or 10 that get along with a somebody like me, my consciousness, existence isn't too shabby and people are pretty great. And if you can learn to mind your own business, people are even better. And if people can mind their own business, oh, existence is even better. That's why I like Croatia. People don't mind their business here. It's nice. And then once I figured out like, oh, I am a reason not to die. Like, oh, oh Brittany, Brittany's a great reason to keep living. Once I made the decision not to unalive myself, it was like, oh, okay, cool. Then it didn't matter what existence was doing. Are they still annoying? Yes. Do I still have to pay my taxes? <laughs> yes. Do I still have to work to make sure I can eat? Yes, because that was the world I was born into. But if for, for, as, you know, for as long as I have a working brain, as long as I can work, as long as I can function, fuck this fibro, fuck this borderline, fuck this PTSD, it ain't going to be the reason I don't succeed. As long as I can move past those things, then I'll be fine playing this game within what's reasonable with my skill set, right? There might always be a circumstance in which it's just beyond me. But for now, it's really not. Getting up and going to work is not beyond my skill set. It's just not. You know, and so I, I used to think it was maybe like, oh, my God, even existing was beyond my skill set. But it's not anymore. I just got better tools, you know, so I'm not going to blame the chicks in bathtubs. I can't blame the Internet. I can't blame anyone for where I'm at when no one is at this moment directly trying to stop me from being happy. Right. Like they just aren't. And so it's me. I'm the only one at that point. I have no one to externally blame. And so then you realize, okay, it has to do with me. What do I do with that information? Now, I wasn't always in that situation and you won't be either. You won't always be in a situation where it's just you. You might be born into a bubble, a cultural background, a worn torn country, a very controversial situation. You might be too brown or too gay or too trans or too something to be somebody that somebody wants to give a chance to, right? So that's you having to battle your existence still. But it doesn't change the relationship you're having with yourself unless you let it, right? Only in the West? Absol absolutely. Well, this person is speaking English. You know? Oh, listen to Asmongold. He's about to explain bubbles really well. So it's, he's probably talking about the West. Like if I go and I watch a video of some guy speaking Chinese and all of his footage is from China... And then I'm like, well, that's not how it go, how it is in the U.S. Well, of course it's fucking not. We are wired. See how we acknowledge that the video or the commenters were commenting on how it works in the video, and they're saying, well, that's just America. And Asmund goes like, yeah, well, we're talking about America, America, the bubble. If we were talking about somewhere else, we'd say it'd work differently there. That's what I mean by bubbles, kids. Pay attention. When you say, well, this is how men are experiencing life. Which men? When you're saying this is how this this is how this person experiences life, which person, which woman, which whatever, which which the who who are you talking about? Because we are not all having the same relationship with existence. And so the moment you can say that out loud, the moment you can say America is not like China, then can you not fathom that I am not like you? That Pearl and I are not the same. That Destiny and I are not the same. That Erudite and I are not the same. That me and Tom Fleury are not the same. Me and Wick are not the same. So when you sit here and you're like, oh, Brittany, who are you giving advice to? I'm giving advice to people that it makes sense for. If you're not that person, go to the place that gives you the advice that works for who you are. Because in my world, my advice works for lots of people. Right? My life works for lots of people. Build-A-Bear works for lots of people. So again... When you sit here and you watch a content creator and you're like, nothing they're saying makes sense. Cool. Not for you, my bros. Not for you, my bros. Not for you. Not for you. I to crave connection, yet the oh, pseudonymity yeah. and detachment of online platforms trigger emotional reactions and amplify negative behaviors, resulting in an ever more polarized society. That's, yeah, true. This is the exact opposite of the original function of the instinct. While online discourse can be useful for staying informed and connecting with others, it is not a good substitute for real communities, as they provide a sense of belonging, shared values, and face-to-face... -face well, I think that for some people, they don't really have the ability to have a community. 
And like, if you contextualize this around, like, let's say 2007 to 2012, okay, where like this. there was a very massive. For, I graduated high school in 2007. I went to public school for two years, okay? Like atheist movement on the internet. And the reason why there was such a massive atheist movement on the internet is because people before then had lived under pseudo suppression of a, like a, a Christian, like I wouldn't say nation, but a Christian society. This was my upbringing. Asma Gold is explaining to you my life. I was in an oppressive Christian bubble in Southern California, Catholic bubble, but I was in a religious place in California all the way Orange County to San Diego is a Republican county. San Diego County, Riverside County, Orange County are conservative bubbles in liberal-ass California. And during that time, my only refuge, my only safe space were atheist communities on the internet that eventually could embrace me into their little bubble but hated me because I was a girl. I was also leaving religion, so I was learning how to embrace my body. And I would do videos with a bikini on. And I would try to embrace the fact that I didn't live at my parents' house. And I was trying to be like um, – like I was trying to like know myself, right? While I was trying to figure myself out, the atheist community hated me because they're like, she's just a slut on the internet. Well, I was literally a virgin. And it was so funny because these same atheists that are like the religious are oppressive are the same grumpy incel men that were trying to oppress women from being sexually liberated because it didn't fit their comfort levels, right? Because it didn't fit their version of what a good woman is. And the irony is like, it doesn't matter if you're an atheist or a religious person, you will oppress. The moment you're a part of a little group, therefore a mob, and you tell people change, that is your version of oppression, right? And you'll do it by bullying and ostracizing, which is why, again, I, I can't wait to talk to Tom again. But when Tom was saying, like, you use techniques to almost ostracize people so they want to change, that's what atheists were trying to do to me. Who gets to pick and choose when we should ostracize people because they wear bikinis, because they have tattoos, because they have body mods, because what? When should we decide we should, quote unquote, ostracize people? And people might say, like, oh, only if they're Nazis. Cool. Who gets to identify the Nazi? Right. Because some people have called me a Nazi like six years ago because I watched Jordan Peterson and I'm like, I don't even like Jordan Peterson bros. OK. And I'm Middle Eastern. Am I allowed to be a Nazi? Like, I don't even understand how these bubbles work anymore. So obviously I tune them out because it's so silly. But to them, it's like their whole life. Right. So here we are acknowledging that this was a real phenomenon for some of us. Now, if you were like in liberal America, maybe this wasn't your problem maybe you weren't coming out of a religious bubble and trying to be gay and trying to be queer and trying to be body positive and sex positive maybe you didn't have this problem but that was my life that was all I consumed right Sam Harris and Dawkins and Hitchens and all those people I Bill Maher I like worshipped them the four horsemen I like worshipped this group like these groups of men to try to give me some rand everybody to try to give me some answer out of religion only to find out, oh, man, you're stuck in your bubbles too. Boring. Those bubbles couldn't fully embrace me. And I couldn't fully embrace them. I don't want to spend my life like trying to destroy religion. I want to spend my life living. I want to have a nice life. And you can't do that if you spend the whole time being angry at somebody else. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. Rock, proper, rock Paper Plato says, hello. Yes, I remember that bikini video and people were losing their minds. Losing their minds. These strong, logical men losing their minds at the sight of tits. And they're still doing it today. They're still doing it today with these girls on the internet. Can you all not handle a pair of tits? Get, literally, get off the pot. Shit or get off the pot. I can't believe these men are logical and strong and they can't even handle a girl getting laid or a girl doing porn or a girl showing off her tits. Like, what are you, a religious person? Move over. So before then, they weren't able to express themselves in a way that you know, they thought was true to themselves. They weren't able to talk about the obvious questions that they weren't able to ask. And after the internet, it gave them that ability. So I think that to say that the internet only takes away is not true. And I think that, you know, again, like that massive atheist awakening for a lot of people uh, is evidence of that. Uh, they got radicalized? No, I, I don't think so at all. I think that these are things that Bro, you don't it's you're not radicalized if you think, hey, maybe Jonah didn't live in a fish for three days. That's not being ra maybe he did. I don't know. <laughs> radicalized. Think about COVID lockdowns without the internet. How would people have coped without the internet? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. I 
Okay, during COVID, if we didn't have the internet, like my family would have been fine. Because again, most people, again, what does being online mean? Like my family likes the internet because they can like do things together. But like I grew up in the 90s without the internet. You just hang out together. You just like read a book. If I didn't have the internet during COVID, I literally just would have read and hung out with my brothers. Like the internet gave us anime to watch and it gave us something to do. And I was working, of course. But if the internet didn't exist by the time COVID happened, wouldn't we have just chilled? Did you think our ancestors hadn't gone through a COVID-like experience without the internet? What are they saying? Am I mishearing this? Are they mis am I mishearing this? What are you talking about? I, but I, I do think that's actually a very strong argument. Like I am an internet enjoyer and I think that I, I think that you cannot suppress and hold back technology and the progress of technology and the way that people interface with it just because you're afraid of what the outcomes are. I think that any time that that happened, like historically, it's always been bad mm -hmm. and it's been viewed as bad. Like in, in retrospect, not just Christian Puritan. Yeah, exactly. So I think that you're still seeing a large, like a, a, a large, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Like a uh, backlash from that. Uh, I think that's why you see so many people that are, you know, like they have to talk about how it's okay for girls to do OnlyFans, for example, because there's such a contingency in a big group of people, maybe in their real life, that don't approve of them doing that. So they go on the internet and then they get that there instead. Wait, Discord's making fun of me. Discord. No one is like me and my advice is for people like me. And there are lots of people who are like me that no one is like me. That's so many people. And they're all identically unique. Yeah. What, does that not make sense to you? None of you are like me, but a lot of people are like me. My advice is for people like me, but nobody is me. But my advice still makes for sense for people like me. When I say I want more men to be like irrelevant, I'm not saying literally the consciousness that is irrelevant. I mean, his introspection, his openness, his kindness. How does that not make sense? And, and, and that's a good and a bad thing, right? I mean, you have some people that are able to find <laughs> like-minded people on the internet and that like-minded group of people is just other people that like watching anime. And then you have other people that find a group of like-minded people on the internet and that group is ISIS. While online platforms offer shallow and faceless connections. I don't think it there is, is any it's meaning what inside these boxes containing digital surrogates. Boxes. They are mostly dopamine hits with diminishing returns, which are fleeting and do not provide any long-lasting purpose. In most... Then stop going after them. I think there's too many people that listen to what the world, what some fucking popular, you know, what some magazine or some TV show mm -hmm. or some... Uh, internet celebrity tells you you should go out and live your life in, in accordance to uh, if you don't think you're going to be happy with one of these things then stop doing it mm. to do that though you would have to have the tool that asmongold has and the tool that i have and the tool that a lot of people have but not a lot of people have you following me that is like a self reassurance a confidence in the self like you i know myself well enough to know when and who to listen to. I know myself, um, I know my self doubts enough to know when to refer to the people that I trust the most to reassure those self doubts, right? And when it's appropriate to hear them, but to understand even when they might be wrong. Um, Discord says there were no atheists before the internet, certainly no union of Soviets that banned religion, no communist Chinese that banned religion. Has anyone ever heard of history? We write stuff down about things that happened in the past. It's something you can check out. We're talking about bubbles, pay attention. Everything is happening at once in the same world that felt so Christian and anti-gay and suffocating to the atheists that existed in a place where you couldn't even say you were an atheist without having no friends. I grew up in a bubble that when I left the church, it was the biggest deal. When you grew up fundamentalist, when you grew up super Catholic, when you grew up actually in a religious bubble, a real religious bubble, not a fake fucking once a year Catholic bubble, not a pick me cafeteria Christian bubble. When you grew up in an actual community where all your friends are Christian or Catholic, and they do not have friends that are atheists. The moment you come in as atheist, you lose the bubble. Your world shatters. At the same time that it's happening, on another part of the same state or the same country or the same town are a bunch of fucking atheists having orgies with no religious people around. I don't give a fuck about you. The point is, is Asmund Gold is explaining a very specific phenomenon that happened to a very specific group in the United States. And at the same time that was happening, 
I'm sure there were pockets of the United States that were gay and trans and orgies, that were all drugs, that were Hollywood coke parties, that were fucking living it up, not believing in God. Cool. We're not talking about you right now. We're talking about this bubble. This one. Stop trying to live your life based off of what somebody else tells you is going to make you happy. I don't know how many times growing up people would constantly tell me this will make you happy. And then I did it and it didn't make me happy. Oh, and great job. This is great. People will tell you every day, do this and you'll be happy. Fuck happiness. Happiness is a joy. I could be happy just watching a fucking TikTok. What is happiness? To the consciousness. It's a moment of time that lasts a second or maybe longer. Your goal should not just be happiness. That's like saying my goal is to be sad. Why? Because it's appropriate. My mom just died. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. You're trying to make sure that you're sad, right? But at the same time, maybe you're happy. Maybe your mom was a cunt. Either way, it's an emotion and it doesn't last and it shouldn't last. That's why if you're sad for too long, they think you might have depression. If you're too happy for too long and you never feel sadness over your cat getting mutilated or your child dying, maybe you have something wrong with you. Emotions shift and change based off context. At least they should. Joy is different. Identity is different. Knowing yourself is different. So when someone says, do this, it'll make you happy and it doesn't work for you, they're trying to give you a tool that worked for them. But you are not them. Just like when I try to give you a tool that worked for me, it might not work for you. You are not me. And then they said I was doing it wrong. No, maybe I just don't like it. Maybe I'm not the same as you. cases people who are deeply involved in digital surrogates are never satisfied the influencer is That's constantly true. seeking to increase their number of followers oh yeah while their audience quickly moves on from one video to the next Very similarly true. the speedrunner is motivated to achieve ever more challenging feats our instincts are not updated to fit the ever increasing amounts of biological exploits that will become more complex as technology progresses I think that's true. especially artificial intelligence yeah Attempting to fulfill instinctual desires from digital surrogates lead to toneless explorations of sensual enjoyments. Abusing our biological imperatives, which are indifferent to our long-term well-being or civilization as a whole, the digital and the analog world are distinctly separate and should be treated as such. No, they're not. The digital and the analog world are not separate at all. I, I think that's, that, that's so silly. That doesn't make any sense. For most people, they are, I think. I, I don't think so at all. I think a lot of people... I think that you, you cannot apply the rules of the internet of 2005 to the internet of 2023. If you went and you said that in 2005, I would agree with you, and I think it was true. Mm. But the truth is that now the internet used to be an alternative life. Now the internet is an extension of your existing life. Mm. 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 Depends That's on the how bubble. it is. Depends on the bubble. Well, it depends on what he means by internet. Does he mean... The internet as a tool, like I need to send my emails, therefore the internet, or does he mean online communities, which are still very specific? So I don't know if you guys know this, but like though my brothers have Discord, my brothers aren't on Discords that their friends didn't create for each other. Like, you know how I run a Discord? You know how YouTubers have a Discord? My siblings are not in the demographic of people who are on YouTubers' Discords. P.S. Join my Discord. But like that is a very specific demographic and bubble of people who join alternative communities or like i know people who are furries you know discord has an official furry discord i know that because my viewers are furries and like i don't have siblings that i know of that are on any discords that they haven't that their friends didn't make versus i am on kyla's discord i'm on Tom Fullery's discord i'm on wix discord i'm on but i don't you know i spend time mostly in my discord but the point is is that some people live on the internet like I do. Some people use the internet like my parents do to send emails. That's not the same as Google Maps is not living on the internet, right? It's just using the internet to make your day work. And then there are people who kind of like spend eight hours a day on TikTok to escape their lives. Also not people that I consider living on the internet because if they brought their real life into the internet, it wouldn't be the same. Like not everybody lives, like some people use it, you know what I mean? So it's just, it depends. 
Oh, is that the end of it? I think videos like this are interesting. However, I do find it to be disappointing that they focus on things like Amarath and uh, different types of like hot button social issues to like to score a few points on that category because I think that it kind of gets people's guard up because as soon as you start doing that, you you automatically alienate a large audience of people. And, and I think it's counterproductive. Uh, other than that, I actually think this video is pretty good and I wish more people talked about this stuff in... I, I, even though I think that this guy was probably wrong on like half of it, I, I, I can appreciate somebody talking about something and at least being willing to be wrong about a question that's complex rather than thinking about how easy it is to answer all the questions that are simple. Mm. Um, I think he means that what you do online will eventually affect your real life unlike 15 years ago when nobody used it. Maybe? I'm still having a, again, I know two, like third of the world doesn't even have access to the internet, right? So again, I, I think for some people who have the internet, it will impact them, right? For people who are using the internet that way, it might. So that, that's the thing. I think sometimes when people talk like that, they're insinuating that like everyone's having the same relationship, but that's just not what's happening. So, okay. So I'm watching Asmongold. I'm like trying to put together in my head, like what level of introspection is Asmongold? See, one, two, three, four, five. Well, he's not a one. I think it's pretty freaking clear. Um, he could be a two, right? I haven't watched everything he's done, so I'm still updating myself on Asmund's work. He could be a three. He's pretty good at bubble hopping. He's pretty good at having a conversation with himself, and he's pretty confident about how he goes through life. He seems to be somebody who questions things. He doesn't really give me four or five vibes, but he definitely has the rhetoric of somebody who's really content and is, seems pretty joyful. So you can be a joyful two, a joyful three. You can be, well, mostly a joyful two. You can be a joyful five. I think three and four are kind of like on a journey that's hard to be joyful. And one's definitely not joyful. So you're having like a relationship with that. Now, I don't know him. So I can't really know, really. I'm going to guess that he could be like a two, three. I'm going to kind of give him that order of introspection. Because again, I don't know how far he takes this. I don't know what questions he's asked himself. I don't know what relationship he has with his consciousness. I don't know what relationship he's having with existence. I don't know all everything there is to know about him. But I thought it was pretty cool that whether he knows it or not, he's using language that separates bubbles. Whether he knows it or not, he's aware of them. Whether he knows it or not, he's definitely chosen the life that works for him. Whether he knows it or not, and I think he does, he looked at the cards he was dealt and said, okay, like, cool, love this. I'm going to do this and hope it works. And he's just unapologetically himself and figures it out. I I am very happy that I watch Asmund now. He's very interesting. I like his vibes. I hope maybe one day we could talk. I know he's a very busy person. I don't know. But yeah, he... he he definitely is aware enough that it'd be cool to have a conversation with him. And that's pretty exciting. And he does a really good job at standing up for himself, but not really like prescribing to others what they should do. But he's really good at standing up for himself. And he's really good for saying like, no, I don't, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with that. I'm, I'm not, I'm not okay with that. Like he's very good at that. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, I really recommend his stuff about interpersonal relationships or when he, he reviews like incel stuffer. Um, you know, stuff about that. I really recommend his work. I don't watch his gaming stuff, but I, his opinions are fun. Thank you.